In this video, we shall learn about eigenvalue and eigenvector. First of all, the pronunciation, it is not eigenvalue, but it is eigenvalue because it's a German word and in the German language, the letter G is used to denote the sound of GA. In fact, they call it the letter G in the German language. Now, the problem is the following. I have a matrix, a square matrix, n by n, over the field C. So, it could be C, it could be R, but typically we will work with C, not any other field. And I want to find out solution to equations like this. I want to multiply a vector x with a and the result I expect to be this. So here this is an n by 1 vector. All entries are complex. Similarly, this is a scalar, a complex number and this is the same x. We want to find solution to this system of equations. Now this naturally first begs the question that why we are trying to solve such a system. Now that question is very important of course, the motivation behind this, but we shall take that up a bit later. Suffices it to say for the time being that various apparently unrelated problems all reduce to solving a system like this. You have to understand that this is not a linear system, it is a non-linear system. Here you are already given only the matrix A. So this is the thing that you are given and you want to find out both AX as well as lambda. So these are the things to be found out, these are the unknowns. So it is a non-linear system because you see you have got lambda times x. So two of the unknowns are multiplied here. So it is not a linear system. So our standard technique of Gauss-Jordan elimination etc. cannot be employed directly. If we have any solution to this system of equations that is some scalar lambda and some vector x such that this holds then we call that lambda as an eigenvalue for that matrix A and the x a corresponding eigenvector of that matrix A. Now of course there is always a trivial solution to this. I can take x equal to just a zero vector. In that case I have zero equal to zero irrespective of whatever lambda I choose. So that is very uninteresting. As a result we put the restriction that x must be that x must be non-zero. So I put the restriction x is non-zero. There is no such restriction on the quantity lambda. <coughs> Here is one example. Suppose I take my matrix A as two zero zero one. In that case, 1, 0 is an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue 2. If I do the multiplication, you will see that this will be 2, 0, which is 2 times 1, 0. To understand the geometric significance of this example, as well as eigenvalues and eigenvectors in general, just consider the linear transformation which is affected by this particular matrix. That's a big and complicated thing for the function a times a vector x. So this is a map. So x y you start with x y which is a point in the plane and you multiply it from the left with 2 0 0 1. So consider this function how it looks. If you do the product you will find it will be 2 x y. So every point x comma y will go to the point 2x comma y. Now let us look at its geometry. Suppose here is my R2. 
and I have drawn a picture. So if I apply the transformation every x y goes to 2 x y that means that the y remains the same if you take a point here its height will remain the same after the transformation but its x value will become double. So the points which are exactly on the y axis will stay where they are. The points which are to the right of the y axis will move to double the distance in the further to the right. The points which are to the left of the x axis will move horizontally to double the distance from the y axis. So how will this picture change? This picture will just fatten out. It will not become taller but it will just fatten out to double the length. So it is roughly, it will be like this. So that is the effect of this function x comma y going to 2xy. <clears throat> now you can see that if I take a vector like this, in that case that vector will move to this. So it moves away from the line because the y part remained the same but the x part widened. So the vector changed direction. If on the other hand you, you take this vector it remains along the same direction but just got stretched and that is precisely the geometric interpretation of eigenvalues and eigenvector. If you take this vector, the vector does not change direction. It merely stretches out or maybe shrinks or maybe just turns around but it remains in the same line. So for a given matrix, we want to know which are those directions that remain unchanged even when we multiply by a matrix. Maybe things will shrink, stretch or flip direction, flip orientation, but they will remain along the same line. Those are precisely the eigenvectors and amount of shrinking or stretching or flipping that will be given by the eigenvalue. Still this does not really tell us why it is important but at least it gives us a geometric interpretation. There are many different reasons why finding eigenvalue and eigenvectors of a matrix is important. Now here is one rather strange application which has revolutionized the world. It is the Google page rank algorithm. So this is the algorithm which Google uses to rank its pages. So when you do a Google search, say with a keyword, in that case, Google finds out all the pages with that keyword in it. But that is not all. It also decides which of these things are important and which are less important and accordingly orders them. And it is this ordering that makes Google so very popular. Now this ordering is based on various things, various considerations including commercial considerations etc. etc. But the basic idea at least when Google started out that was the basic idea that the important pages should come first and the less important one should come next. Now how do you decide about what is important and what is not? So here is a little sample internet. So these are the different websites or web pages and these arrows give you the links. For example, 2 links to 3, 3 will link to 5, 5 links back to 3 and in this way the internet is a huge connected diagram. <clears throat> now I want to associate an importance measure with each of these pages like 3 is important, 5 is not important. 2 is uh, somewhat important. So I want to give a marks or a score, important score and that is what is called its page rank. So once you have those page ranks then Google can list them in decreasing order of page ranks. Now if I just look at it naively I might think that 3 is very important because all the other li sites link to 3. So 3 is very important. So one naive way of Deciding about the page rank could be the number of incoming links. But that's not always correct because if you look at 6, it has got only one incoming link. But since that one incoming link comes from this very popular site 3, 
So that one incoming link is of great importance. So just that one is not merely one. That one is from some very important page. So just the incoming link is not enough. You have to also take into account the particular website that links to you. For example, if I have a website and <clears throat> say the Reserve Bank of India website links to that page, then naturally my importance goes up. So not merely the number of incoming links should be important. So the question is, how do we actually decide? Now the way Google thought about it, that was their first paper, that was their part of their thesis, was this. That suppose there is a random browser, so or a guy who is just browsing randomly, and this random browser starts at some point. So he is starting from, say, 1. So you are now at 1. And because this fellow is a random browser, he just takes up all the outgoing links and picks any one of them at random and clicks on it. Suppose he takes this and comes to 3. Now again here, he will pick up any one of the random outgoing links. He possibly picks up these and comes to 5. And then he picks up one of the random links. Well, suppose he picks this and comes back to 3. And in this way, he goes on and on and on. Now, Google's idea is, if a page is very well connected with others, then naturally, you will be coming to that page again and again and again and again. So, that will give you an idea about which page is more important. If you just keep on randomly clicking, then you will find that there are certain pages where you are going much more frequently than some other pages. So that is what they wanted to find out. Suppose I play this game a large number of times and I find that after playing it say 1 million times, I get that I am, I am here x1 amount of time. That's a random, no. So that's a random variable. I am here x2 amount of time, x3 amount of time and so on. Say I have played it 1 million times, so I will find out the proportion of time I spent there. So if I play it n times and then it is x1, so I might call it x1n, x2n. So if I have done this for n steps, the total number of times I have hit 1, if I call it x1n like that, so xin divided by n, the proportion of time you spent in web page i, that turns out to have a limit. And that limit, as n goes to infinity, that limit is what Google uses as its page rank. Of course, this is not counting the various commercial considerations. This is the core idea. So this is its page rank. Now, how do you find this out? It turns out that this, the vector of all these page ranks, that is in this case I have got six, so I have got six such limits and you can easily see that those limits must add up to one because all the si x size will sum up to n. So you have a basically a probability vector and that probability vector is an eigenvector of a certain matrix. The matrix gives you uh, the connectivity of these various websites. <clears throat> so what Google really does is that they take the huge internet network constructs that matrix you understand that's a huge 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 matrix and computes that particular eigenvector and uses that as its page rank and in order to do this they need something a bit above one month to go through the entire internet and do this thing so they so they update it completely typically after a bit more time over one month at least that's what they claim now how exactly this becomes a problem in eigenvector is not at all difficult to see but I am not going to do that in this short video. So if you are interested you might look up this book Linear Algebra with Applications by Stephen Leon. Now here is a completely different application of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Here is an experiment that you can do yourself if you take an egg and try to rotate it as a top on this major axis, you will find that after a few initial turns, 
it will automatically shift to its minor axis and start rotating around that as if the egg loves to rotate more around this axis than around that axis. And this can be explained using energy considerations. And there are certain objects, certain three-dimensional objects which are so very weird that if you start rotating it around, around some particular axis, somehow they will automatically shift their axis and start rotating around some other axis. There are particular tops soul that just behave like magic because you start spinning them in one direction and they start spinning in a completely different direction. Now in order to explain this or in order to find for any given three-dimensional object what is its most favored direction of rotation, physicists proceed like this for any direction, for any given axis, it could be some oblique axis like this. So it is just a direction, so it is an unit vector in R3. They will work out the amount of kinetic energy that is there in the top or in that 3D object if you are rotating it around that particular axis. Assuming that your omega, which is your angular velocity, is say 1. So I keep it fixed at 1. So you just vary this thing. So whether you rotate it like this, you rotate it like this, or you rotate it like this, or rotate it like this. For different values of u, you work out the amount of kinetic energy, Ke, u. And that may be worked out using whatever physics formula there are. I do not care about that. Except that it turns out, if you write down that those expressions, it will always turn out to be an expression like this, u transpose m u. So it is a rho vector, then a square matrix, not only a square but a symmetric matrix with the same vector written as a column. So it is a scalar quantity, 1 by 3, 3 by 3, then 3 by 1. This matrix will depend on the particular geometry or the mass distribution of that three-dimensional object. And this has a name, this is called <coughs> the moment of inertia matrix, whatever that is. Now, the direction along which it likes to turn is the direction along which this thing will be maximized. So, in order to find that direction, you have to maximize this function. And when you do that, quite surprisingly, the answer turns out to be the eigenvector of m. And the maximum kinetic energy itself turns out to be the corresponding eigenvalue. It is surprising, counterintuitive and a beautiful fact of mathematics that you are going to learn the proof of later. But that happens. So that is one major use of eigenvalues and eigenvectors in physics and in statistics also we use it more or less for the same purpose except that we do not talk about kinetic energy but we talk about variance of certain quantities. So that is enough of motivation about why eigenvalues and eigenvectors are things to care about.